Welcome to the Game of Impossible podcast. My name is Leon and this is Idris Jala. This is a father-son podcast where we discuss all things transformation through the lens of business, leadership, sport, and occasionally faith as well. Today, we are in episode six and uh, we are going to be talking about one of your uh, principles, which is divine intervention. Probably a bit of an uh, unconventional one uh, for a, a businessman, a technocrat and a practitioner. Um, can you explain the importance of divine intervention and what exactly we mean uh, when we say divine intervention? Divine intervention is an idea that comes from the notion that not everything is within our control. So leaders need to be vulnerable to be able to accept the fact that they don't control everything. So then the question in life is that who is in control? Some people say it's luck, some people say it's fate, some people say it's feng shui, but many of us, including myself, believe that there is a role that God plays in it. And that's why I use the term divine intervention. The question that's most pertinent is what leaders need to do to make sure that the divine intervention work in their favor. That's the topic of today. Why do you think that um, having this kind of a belief is important, uh, whether, whether as a leader or in any kind of pursuit that you are after? There are two reasons why I think it's very important. The first one being, I call it the first experiential truth. That means there are many things that are outside our control. For example, in businesses, you don't know price, for example, crude oil price. No one can control it. Now it's in Shell, where the mercy of oil price changes. And the whole world was on its knees during the pandemic, and we couldn't control this. So if I ask you, Leon, to write down 10 big things that happened in your life and ask one question after you've written the 10 things, how many of those things happened exactly the way they did? because you caused them to happen. And if the answer is yes, put a tick. If the answer is no, you didn't cause them to happen exactly the way, put a, an X on them and count them. On my sheet, 70% of them were not because of me. They were because of divine intervention. And that is one experiential truth. And another experiential truth is, and I kind of reflect on life. Over the years, I became very convinced the life is a continuous reduction of options. Do you remember when, when we were all young? Someone asked a question, what's your ambition in life? In the morning, you would say, I want to be a fireman. In the afternoon, I want to be a rock star. In the evening, I want to be a billionaire. You know, everything is possible. But as you grow in life, if you're not very good in maths, you can't become an engineer, you can't be a doctor, you can't even be a dentist. I don't know what pulling tooth has got to do with, uh, dent uh, with maths. But nonetheless, it reduced option. So when you go out to university, you can't do five degrees at a time. You can only do one. So when you come out to work in a corporate world, you can't join one bank and another bank and a third bank. You got to join one bank. So the options reduce. When you get married, also option reduce. You could choose one, one wife. So there's a lot of things. So if I put those two experiential truths together, that means... 70% of the things that happen to you are not because of what you control. And the other one is life is continuous reduction of option. Life is actually quite miserable. You find yourself vortex in a corner that your options are so much reduced and you can't control them. So this idea here brings to the fore the notion that leaders need to be vulnerable. So vulnerability is a virtue. Humility is a virtue. It's so in transformational leadership, anyone that believes that the world is at their feet and they control everything in the world, I think they are deluding themselves. You've got to realize that you are vulnerable and vulnerability is a virtue. And so that's a very important point. That's why I, for these two reasons, because of the experiential truth, I am become so convinced there is a part to play in including in the portfolio of leadership, the idea of divine intervention. Um, Alan Watts said, to have faith is to trust yourself to the water. When you swim, you don't grab hold of the water because if you do, you will sink and drown. Instead, you relax and you float. I think that's very much in line with what, with what you are talking about. Back to your point on the reduction of options. I think for me personally, this is something that maybe I used to struggle with. Um, I have always 
liked having the option to do things. I think generally how I've approached life is I, I often see myself as a, as, a, as a jack of all trades. Um, and and while, I, I, while I really enjoy doing that, it's only been in the last few years where I've thought a bit more seriously about um, finding an area of, of focus. I will never stop wanting to pursue and to try to be good at many different things but I do see the need to know how to prioritize certain things. Um, and actually, what has given me a lot of peace in being able to uh, reduce or say no to certain things is actually this, knowing that we are not uh, 100% in control of all outcomes, uh, and nor should we as well. I think and when we, when we accept that, we are able to find a bit more peace in the things that we have committed to. It's not just about rel relinquishing control, um, but then actually having peace for the now, peace for the thing that you have set your mind uh, to do. Yeah, I think in my own experience, let me talk about this reduction option, how things had opened for me that I didn't actually make happen because I wanted it that way. When I finished my first degree, all I wanted to do was to become an academician. And so I graduated top of the class in uh, USM, so I had the Bishan Co Award, and then they offered me a scholarship to go and do a, a master's and PhD in Pennsylvania. Um, that was what I thought, and that was the final year of our exams. But my, you know, we our we were living in Miri at that time, and I was looking at an advertisement, and the advertisement said, "If you apply to work for Shell, we will pay for your ticket." So I wasn't really interested in working for Shell. I just wanted a ticket to go home because in my mind, I set myself to go and uh, to do, uh, uh, to become a professor at the university. So I accepted the offer from USM. That's what we, they offered me the job simply because I wrote a very cocky letter. I said, I'm the man you're looking for. So they were very interested in who is the young man that had the audacity to say that. So I got called for an interview and I got the job. So I started to do that. It was a, a HR job, and I never planned to work in human resource. But uh, to cut a long story short, I went to do the job. I fell in love with the job. When I, get, I stayed in the job for altogether 10 years in my early part of my life, actually. Then there was a time that I, I felt that option had become so much reduced. I never wanted to do that. But I shall send me to do my master's in industrial relations in Warwick. And so when I came back from there and Sheldon sent me to do HR in the in Nether Netherlands for four years, you spend your early years in the Netherlands at that time. Then I, I look at myself, wow, how, how is it that I've now suddenly spent 10 years to do something I had never planned to do? I wasn't, I wasn't in control of my life and I really wanted to do something else. But suddenly out of the blue, the chairman of Shell, Dato Chris Knight, called me and said, you know, Idris, I'm going to start up a transformation of Shell Malaysia. And I, I have six people in my mind to form the core team that will work directly with me and you one of them. And so you will now work in business re-engineering to help me go and do this whole transformational journey. So, I mean, I didn't apply for the job. From then on, I went on to do that. I finished that role and new opportunities open, opportunities into retail. So I went into sales manager for a, a petrol station for Shell Malaysia. Within one year, I became the national sales manager for Shell within the group. It was really quite remarkable. Now, the question here was, I return back to the point that I wasn't in control and life was a reduction of option. And if... If, if divine intervention didn't come, I would have never got out from HR. I probably would have spent my whole life doing that. I don't know. But that, more, more important than that, there. So every other job that came to me was actually I didn't apply for them. Malaysia Alliance, I didn't apply. The job in Shell, Sri Lanka, I didn't apply for a job. When I became a minister, I never applied for the job. The job came to me. So I became very convinced that in life, some doors closed before you, some doors opened before you. And the only thing I contribute to that was, I wouldn't say it's luck, 
I wouldn't say it's fate. In my case, I concluded it has all to do with God. And that's why I use the term divine intervention. As, as Christians, you know, we, we often say our, one of our favorite verses as a family is that all things work out for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28. Uh, that is a bit of a cornerstone passage for this family. I suppose for us, it also means that when things don't go our way, you know, I, actually, case in point, you, your whole career trajectory is not at all what you would have planned because, as you mentioned, yeah. you had wanted to, to study law. Yeah, I think what, was... you, what you forgot to mention there <laughs> yeah. is actually the fact that your offer letter did come in, but it was sent to uh, my grand auntie's house and they were holidaying in, uh, Europe. in Europe. Correct. So you did not receive, you did not see the offer letter and therefore you thought that you didn't get the offer and because of that, you ended up going yeah. um, to university. Uh, university what, what Science you, Malaysia, yeah. yes. What did, you, what did you do there instead of law? I went to do development studies and management. This was the, the program that I went to. And uh, it, interestingly enough, when I left that I mean, I did develop development economics. I understood how countries need to develop and did all do. But then my job was in Shell. I spent 23 years in Shell and another three years and eight months in uh, Malaysia Airlines. I've often wondered, how is it that I went to do development studies? I never had the opportunity to use any of these concepts. Then suddenly I got a call from the Prime Minister appointing me as the minister. Then it dawned on me, everything that I studied for four years in USM in Penang suddenly came to light and they were totally applicable. Development economics, I understood them. I knew many things. And interesting, the first job we did when we became private was Tanzania. President Kikwete called me and said, it is, I want you and your team to come to Tanzania to help me to do economic and social transformation. And you know what, Leon? When I was in USM, I studied many things that Julius Nyerere did in Tanzania, the Ujama villages. I just looked at it and said, wow, nothing that had happened in my earlier part of my life came by accident. They were there by divine appointment because I would have never known that the first work that we were going to do with, with Tanzania. And so when I walked inside there, I kind of felt that I knew that place, although I've never been there before. So to this day, President Kekwete and I have become very good friends. And so we spent all together three years uh, in, in, in Tanzania, my team and I, doing all that. But so I can attribute this to divine intervention. So having an attitude uh, of accepting um, or leaning on divine intervention, it allows us to, uh, to trust that things will work out. And even if things don't immediately work out, i.e. a case like this where things seem to be uh, derailing you from your original plans, actually we can um, have the assurance in knowing that sometimes those doors are shut uh, in order to open something far more fruitful and far more profound. I wonder, however, I mean, that's easy for, for us as Christians and, and for people of other faiths as well um, to lean on. I wonder how do we uh, resolve this with maybe people who, who don't have a faith? Yeah, I think people who don't have a faith. That's why I don't use the word God. And I use the word divine intervention because I want to be inclusive for them. What if you're an atheist and don't believe in any form of higher power? But I think they would convince yeah. them to also have a, a similar attitude. Yeah. What might okay. that look like in yeah. that context? To the atheist, this is how I will have the conversation. I will ask him to write down the 10 big things that happened in his life or her life and say how many of those things uh, happened the way they did, exactly the way they did because of what he or she did. And then I'll begin with them recognizing the fact that life is not in their control. Not everything in life is within their control. And the second thing was, I'll ask them the question about the experiences and how the options have been reduced to them and how options have opened. And then the question arising is, who is in charge of life? So I will put the, the question solidly for those things that are outside their control, who's in charge? They may offer to say it's fate. And they may offer to say it's luck. They may offer to say it's feng shui. Or some, the ones, of course, people like us, we believe is God. 
it doesn't matter how they how they respond to it. The question today is that whatever force there is available, but things will happen to them, not because they have designed and wanted them to be the way they did. And so that's how I would have that conversation. So they open their mind to it. In in all my conversation, if you use divine intervention, it's much more palatable to people rather than the word God. But I, I, I'm trying to use the term because it's a lot more inviting for people to accept the notion. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. And there's something to be said there about, you touched on this earlier, about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, to be vulnerable, actually in a very practical sense as well, uh, I have personally found is a very helpful uh, posture to adopt. You know, we can often think that vulnerability would actually be counterproductive as a leader because you think, you know, as a leader, you are, people look to you to set a direction. Uh, and that is true. But you can also go down the other end of the spectrum where you become kind of a, uh, too much of a dictator. Um, and actually, sometimes you can get the reverse effect where if you um, overly control or try to control outcomes and how things are done, uh, you might actually find that sometimes your team's might actually be less bought in. They might actually still do the work uh, that is asked of them. Um, but I think when we, are, uh, when we have too much of a tight fist on things, uh, there can be a tendency for people to be very transactional with the work that they do. So they do what is asked of them, but perhaps they might not be doing it with the same level of conviction versus a team that feels, okay, my leader has given us a semblance of a direction, my leader has a conviction in what he or her um, is asking us to, to, to do. However, I also see that this leader or this boss is inviting us on this journey to figure some things out and that there are certain gaps that they are not, um, not insecure about but are very open about and saying, okay, this is where we need to go. Here are some key competencies uh, that are required to get there, I now empower you as someone who I've recognized to have those key competencies mm. to help me, to help us journey together to get there. And that's where you actually truly get a team that is very, very bought in. It is very much like how your labs in Pamandu Associates um, operates. The yeah. fact that everybody is in, everybody is involved, the best of the private and public sector are involved in coming up with these plans that's how we often find that it's in the implementation that things just kind of run a lot smoother and people are really bought in because they were part of that journey from the beginning. Yeah, let me build on that idea of vulnerability as a virtue. You see, if you've done your very best and things don't work out, you don't go and shoot yourself because you've done your very best. That's the same attitude that you take with your staff. That means you ask them to do their very best. And if they've done their very best within their control, certain things happen outside their control, and it didn't come out, the results didn't come the way. Don't go and shoot them. So this is the point about when you tell people, you, for yourself, all you need to know is as long as you've done your very best, relax when the outcome don't come and the things outside your control. And that's the same attitude that you have with other people. If you have that same attitude, you will then have a team that is completely at peace with themselves, and all they know is that they're doing the best they can. Now, I return back to the point that at which point do you become directive, and at which point do you empower people to go and do things out? Uh, you remember we talked about situational leadership. And we did cover that very clearly. And the start of the journey, you can be a directive in the beginning. You must know where is true north, where you're going with that. But at the end of the day, when the guys know what they're doing in the labs, they can implement it. You must learn to let go because you can't be doing everything on your own and be able to succeed. And in a large organization, being ambidextrous is very, very important. But I return back to the point about vulnerability as a virtue that you leaders must recognize the world is not at their feet. Yeah. Lao Tzu put it quite well. He said, by letting it go, it all gets done. The world is won by those who let go. But when you try and try, the world is beyond the winning. That's nice. Uh, 
I think the other thing is, I mean, just an example of our, my, my context, my, my church context. Um, one of our, we, we, we believe in this culture of, of feedback. Um, and the reason for this is we want to create a team uh, that is self-aware. I think the higher your level of self-awareness, the lower the degree of potential uh, conflict. What we mean by this is when we are very self-aware about things that have gone wrong and we feel like this is a, we are in a space where we can be open and transparent about those things, you are less likely to find instances where um, things are bottled up and you, you, you build up into resentment and then things get, uh, you know, come out in a public forum. So, and we've talked about this in, a, in previous episodes, but we exercise a weekly uh, check-in, mm. weekly one-to-one -one between, uh, you know, a team member and, and line manager. Um, and I remember when I first joined the team, uh, my, my boss at the time, she had this very unusual way of modeling this. I think she modeled this to an extreme that was, uh, at first I thought, oh, this is probably not very good um, for her as a leader. It's not a great look. And what I mean by that is, you know, if she would, if there was ever um, an error that was on her part, or even maybe if it wasn't on her part, she would position it as assuming that, oh, it might have been, it might have been my mistake. Mm. Or if indeed it was her mistake, she will be very upfront about the fact that, oh, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I, I stupidly made, made this mistake. And I used to think, actually, maybe she shouldn't, she shouldn't do that. But then over time, what I started to realize is the value of her doing that is that it started to make me feel a lot more comfortable as yeah. well with yeah. when things didn't go wrong. And rather than trying to cover up, which often the more we try to cover up something that has gone wrong, uh, the result of that will end up rearing its head somewhere down the line. Um, but what I found is that it made not only me a bit more willing to accept when things have gone wrong, but then I looked around me and I realized we are a team that is very open to admitting when things go wrong. And the more we have this culture of being open to admit when things go wrong um, and to be able to debrief uh, very openly and honestly. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the rather than it being, okay, this is a get out of jail free card for me to make more mistakes, you're actually less likely to repeat the mistake mm. because you are no longer trying to rectify the mistake out of fear, but you are now rectifying the mistake, yeah. having really debriefed it as a team, celebrated what did go well, and then you are now in a place where you can very constructively deal with the, the error so you're then taking action, not from a negative standpoint, but now from a positive. There's something very freeing about bringing something into the light. And I think the same can be said for, you know, why therapy mm. uh, is important, why therapy is helpful for, for people, um, simply because it allows them the opportunity to put an issue out into the light. And when sometimes when things are in the light, you might either find that you're better able to deal with it, or you might realize that because it's out there, it wasn't as bad as you thought it was yeah. when it was living in your head. Yeah, we spent quite a fair bit of time talking about the conditions, the circumstances that put us in a, in, in a corner where divine intervention is a very important subject. Now, the question key is this. What do we do to make sure that divine intervention work in our favor? And that's a very important segue that we now shift. I would like to shift gear. To my mind, uh, Leon, there are three very important pointers that one need to do. And if you do them, somehow or other, the things that are outside your control, the opportunities come in your favor. Let me take them one by one. The first one is leaders must all become good human beings. And if you do good, good will come back to you. If you do bad, bad will f catch up on you. So that's first. The second one is a question about leadership. That one has to be ethical in everything you do. And the third one is to go through a whole notion of reflection in solitude so that you look at yourself in the mirror to make collective changes. These three things are very important. And I think if you do all three, for some reason or other, in my own experience, many things come in your favor. 
divine intervention, good things come to you. And uh, so if you're good human beings, you're ethical in the things you do, and you're always looking at yourself in solitude, in self-renewal, then you will make a lot of things happen. The divine intervention come in your favor. Let me give some example uh, so that we can uh, take this and uh, one at a time. The first one is this whole notion of become a good human being. We all have to do good things to other people. So it doesn't mean you have a lot of money. If you have a lot of money, I, I encourage the listeners who are billionaires to donate money to the poor. That's very important. But even if you don't have much money, and if you see an, an elderly person that's coming up the supermarket struggling to put all the groceries in her car, I think that's a time that you can step out there and help to carry things. Those small acts of kindness. These are things that are big and small that shows that you are you care for other people. And so the second one is this very important notion of dealing with ethics. And I, will, I liken them to three circles. The first circle is the white circle. The second circle is the gray. And the third one is the, the, the black. The black is the things that are illegal, corrupt, wrong things to do. And you shouldn't be doing them. The white circle has the right things to do, legal, that are not corrupt, proper things to do. But the gray is the things that are not exactly wrong, not exactly right, not exactly legal and not exactly illegal, but they are in between. The more you go in an organization, the more you rise in an organization, the more you realize that you work, you are confronted with so many ethical issues that you have to confront. The question is, how do you deal with this? I have three very simple rule of thumb that tells me, if I follow, follow that, and I, I know that I'm always handling it correctly, ethically. Every ethical issues that I'm confronted with, rule number one, never decide on my own. Because if I decide on my own, I'm relying on my conscience to make a decision on what to do with it. So one conscience is not good enough. Bring it to a group of people, management team or the board, so that more conscience are looking at the same idea so that there are collective decisions about what is the right thing to do. Hopefully, you get a more ethical decision to be made. So that is a second one. The second, the first one. The second one is once you have got many people, write down the facts facts of the case, the pros and cons of each of the options available, and then ask the team, now that we've written down the facts, now that we look at the pros and cons of all the options available, let's now choose one and let's justify why is that option better than the other options. And the third, which is the litmus test, if we make the decision on the best option, we then put to the test the question, if this piece of paper get leaked in the social media, can we defend the decision that we have made? I can tell you many things that are gray, that's unethical, you cannot defend in the public domain. And so that last, the litmus test, putting that to the test is very, very important. So I have one of my colleagues who was doing some work in Russia he asked me how to deal with these ethical issues. And I told him, look, uh, his name is Chris Tan. So I asked Chris, why don't you write down all the facts of the case, you and I engage, write it down, and then put to the test. After you've written down, ask the question whether we can defend this in public domain. You know, halfway through, he called me, said, boss, I've written the document. I don't even need to finish it. Even after page two, I realized that if this is leaked in the social media, I cannot defend it. There you are, Chris. You know already the options that you're suggesting is just not, not implementable. We can't just do that. And it goes back to the importance of there's a difference between verbally discussing it yeah. in a meeting versus writing it writing down. Writing it down. There's a lot of power <laughs> in seeing something written in paper because yeah. that same convert that same those same sort of things could have come up verbally. Yeah. But it probably would not have been quite as compelling yeah. as when you see it uh, in the light of day on a piece of paper or yeah. you know on on a screen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's the second thing. 
That means doing things ethically. And the third one is that spending time. Leaders are so busy, you know, Leon, you guys doing things in the church. Every Sunday, you've got so many things to do. And in the corporate world, we have so many things. We're so busy, but we never spend time to reflect. So I believe leaders must make it a practice. For me, I encourage people to take once in two weeks in solitude, be alone by yourself in a corner, undisturbed by anybody. You sit down there and ask the question, over the last two weeks, what have I done right? What have I not done right? What can I do to correct this? This is looking at yourself in the mirror. This is when you then look at your experience and then add reflection onto it. You get wisdom. To me, wisdom comes through experience and reflection. Most of us don't get wisdom because we have the experience, but we never spend time reflecting on it. And so if you spend time in solitude, which is the words different from loneliness, and loneliness is to be alone when you don't want to be alone. In solitude means you are alone in deep reflection. So you now reflect over the last two weeks, what have you done right and wrong? What can you do to correct it? So when you go to this whole notion of of solitude and reflection, you become a lot wiser. That's how you become much, much wiser in leadership. Because you then put to the test everything that you are going through and honest to yourself, that's how you make the correction. So I believe in my life that if you do those three things, that means be a good human being, make the ethical decisions, and go through a very regular routine for self-reflection and renewal, then I think you're going to make divine intervention work in your favor. For some reason, you'll be surprised. Suddenly, the doors open before you that you never even imagined that was possible for you to do. And you never even imagine. In my life, I would say, so many of the jobs that happened to me, nothing to do with me applying for the job. I didn't even know. I didn't even think. It wasn't even my radar. So the doors opened before me. So the notion before, when I said life is a continuous reduction of option, when divine intervention work in your favor, so many doors open before you, even though sometimes you don't deserve them. This is the notion about grace. I like your point about wisdom and taking the time to reflect. You know, it's actually the higher your degree of expertise or seniority, uh, actually the, the easier it is for you to start to get used to just going through the motions, uh, which is why you actually need to make that a discipline yeah. um, to reflect. Uh, and also to, to pen down uh, your thoughts, as you said, because actually not only is that uh, beneficial to you as a leader in helping you to process things, but ultimately I think that is also how we are able to then scale um, mm. things, methodologies for the rest of our teams as well. Because if we are uh, you know, people who just have ideas and keep them to ourselves and don't really spend time to think, okay, how can I translate this into something that is maybe useful for other people? Um, there isn't actually learning in there. You don't fully understand something until mm. you have taught it. Yeah. Um, so I think having that attitude is also very important. Very good. At a practical level, it really uh, helps uh, not only ourselves, uh, but it also helps our teams. And so on that, I'm just curious to know what are your ways of, uh, of, of retreating? What are your rhythms like? Rhythms are just being quietly by yourself in a corner, you know, in the leaf there. Sometimes I sit down and do that. In the leaf space, it's a, it's a place where I can, I can sit down, I can do guitar, I can sit down and reflect and do on, on my own. So that's my reflection that I do that on my own. But I do on a daily basis, I try to work with your mom. We do Bible in one year. That means using Nicky Gumbel's uh, tool. So if we do it every day, that means we will cover the whole Old Testament and the New Testament in one year. So we've been doing this all now, I think, for five years. But we haven't been entirely disciplined in doing it. But And I would say in the entire five years that we've been doing it, for sure we would have covered already the Bible a few times over. And that is the time for reflection. We do our own daily devotion using the tool that is there. But that's when I do it together with, with your mom. But I do on my own once in two weeks. I just go and reflect it. 
and I get a piece of paper. This is what I write on my piece of paper. And nowadays, the latest thing that I do is there are three columns in it. I now reflect a lot more on worldviews. So I write on the first column, this is the world, a particular thing that's happening. Let's say the Israel Hamas situation. I put that that's a topic. Then I put in the next column, what are my views with regards to that issue? Having reflected on the things I've read and I observed. And the last column is, where are the evidence to support the views that I have on these things? So when you put down the three columns, you really are forced to really confront your biases, because if they're not backed by evidence, then you know you are having bias on the subject. You have to put evidence. The interesting things, if you routinely do this, and yet you say, what's your routine? If you routinely do this, and the next time you are going to meet with many friends over a dinner party, they talk about a subject of that nature. And if you've done this routinely every two weeks, suddenly you become wise. People say, wow, that's that's quite incredible, it is. Uh, I never thought of it that way. You know why? Not that I'm cleverer. I just had spent time reflecting. If the guy had reflected much the same way as I did, he would have much been wiser because in the dinner table when people are having a chat, people are thinking on the back of the seat of their pants. They're just thinking there and then. You know, I don't do that but I, because I already thought about it for very long. So I... I have my views about the Russian conflicts too, because I thought about it, I reflect on it, and I have my views about organizational change. And my, it's because I've thought about them. And so and I think in time, if you practice this, so I've moved away from looking at myself in the mirror to looking at the world and things happening outside there. What are my teachable point of view? What are the evidence that I have available? having reflected on it, to support those views. And how would I argue those views? So I think it's very important to create this point about self-renewal and reflection. That's how you get wisdom. I always believe that, you know, in my, my, my training is uh, as, a, as a writer, and that has then uh, gone on into, you know, content creation. But writing has always been um, at the core of it. And I think... Um, Actually, beyond that, at its core, it's 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 communication, and I think that's what I'm I'm most passionate about. Um, and I think to your same point, I always believe that the best communicators are listeners first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. If you are unable to listen well, to draw from other sources, you know, to read, to to listen to podcasts, whatever it is, or surround mm. yourself with uh, with wise counsel. Um, Actually, you're not going to be that effective a communicator because then you are only limited by yeah, your true. own your own yeah. thinking, your own modalities of thought. Um, but actually, in developing a rhythm uh, or a discipline of listening well um, to all sorts of sources, mm -hmm. uh, that is where you actually draw a lot of wisdom. I can tell you one little episode. You, you, the comments that you made before about reflection, you know, it really caused me to think. When I was in Shell, Netherlands, I had a boss by name of Don Jones. I worked with him for altogether four years. And in my final day in the office, he called me into his office. He said, young man, you sit there in a chair. I'm going to give you very important fatherly advice. Uh, you, will, you do not deserve it, but you'll get it anyway, he said. <laughs> I remember he put his feet on the table. He was just like that. And so... Uh, he said, you know, I'm going to tell you this because I thought long and hard about this, about my own life, he said. This is his own reflection. Throughout my entire 30 years of career, I asked the question, in fact, I'm smarter than my big boss, the top guy in HR, but he didn't make it. He asked him the question, why didn't he make it to the very top in human resource for the group? And why did that guy make it? He concluded the answer is very simple. That is, as he became more and more senior, and that was one of the comments you made before, he became very aware of what works and what doesn't work. And so every time he, if some young people come to ask him, he wants to tell them the answer. Because he said, you're wasting time. Because if you keep on telling people the answer, they will never really learn. They never really grow.
So every time he made that repeated mistake, according to him, that as he became more senior, he became more and more impatient with young people because he already think he knows the answer and therefore he prescribed the answer. So therefore people that work for him, they never felt they could grow because he strategicated them. So he said that was the biggest reflection he had in his 30 years of his own life. That's why he never gave it to the top. So then he said, Idris, I'm just giving you this advice because I kind of like you. I want you to remember this as you grow up in Shell, the more senior you become, I tell you, you'll become less and less patient with young people because you think you know. Please make sure you to put a massive handbrake to that. Allow people to make some mistakes. All you want to ask them to do is do the best they can. Let them make the mistakes. Let them discover. And that's how they grow. So now you can go. You don't deserve it, but you get it. You can leave now. I mean, that advice that he gave to me was really something that rang into my head. Many, many years, I've worked for more than 35 years. And that advice from Don Jones is a solid one that stayed in my head for very, very long. Absolutely. And so, you know, that wraps up our six-part series on the six secrets of transformation uh, based on the book uh, that you are writing and that will be coming out uh, in, in due time. But that does not mark the end of this podcast, however. Uh, we are committed, publicly committed, publicly very much pregnant, as you have mentioned yeah. <laughs> uh, in your previous episode, uh, very much pregnant to continue to deliver these podcasts on a weekly basis on a Friday. Um, now, with this series out of the way, uh, that actually gives us a more open platform. Uh, and so we'd love to get your ideas on topics or even questions that you'd like to ask. A few ways you can do this. Uh, we encourage you to comment in the comment section if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening on Spotify, um, we encourage you to uh, go on to our social media platforms. Uh, the Game of Impossible on both IG but also on TikTok, specifically on IG. We're going to be posting IG stories at the Game of Impossible, um, asking questions. So we'd love to take in some of your questions, and these will help to shape uh, our subsequent episodes. We look forward uh, to exploring a new format together with you, our listeners and viewers. And uh, we just want to say thank you so much for joining us so far. And do subscribe, uh, do uh, hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified when a new episode drops. Thank you so much for listening.